I'm 26 years old. I live in, uh, in Jerusalem. I am a graduate of the Mixed Cities course, and I'm currently in the Facilitators course. Um, I, about the course in general, so it's about uh, well, uh, mixed cities in Israel, cities that Arabs and Jews live together in the same city, sometimes in the same neighborhood, sometimes even in the same building. Um, we learned about uh, different phenomena in uh, mixed cities like education, um, development, buildings, uh, things like that happening in mixed cities uh, by lectures, tours, um, dialogues that we had with each other in the group and from the personal stories we learn about what's happening and what's going on in mixed cities. Um, I didn't grow up in a mixed city. I live in Jerusalem, but I don't consider it as a mixed city. So I personally don't have an actual connection to it, but I came mostly to learn. I had more knowledge about what's going on and uh, from personal connection with the, about Palestinians, mostly from the, the West Bank, uh, Gaza, um, East Jerusalem, not much about the people that have the same ID that I have, most of the time speak the same language as I'm speaking. So it was more an, a learning experience and getting to know people. We were a group of the majority, big majority of uh, women. That was really um, great and empowering and bring, brought a lot of inspiration. And we went out with ideas. Some when some started to happen about projects. Some are still in the idea uh, stage, but we know that we have each other. We know that we have the network that started, and it's only getting bigger. I had an idea during the course that I'm working about it now. It's still not going like it's not. It didn't start yet um, to create a photography course that will combine um, dialogue and non-violence communication methods and tools uh, in Jerusalem for uh, the citizens of Jerusalem divided half and half, of course, Palestinians and Israelis. Um, so now I'm in the stage of uh, getting the money for it, but it's all written and I have partners and I have most of the things, just need <laughs> the funding, but this is one of something small that came out of this course. Thank you. I, I will make it short as possible. Uh, I'm, I'm a graduate of the uh, upcoming political uh, politicians uh, course of uh, I uh, registered and uh, done this course when I was uh, f 30 years, four, uh, uh, before, four years uh, uh, before four years. Until then, I had almost non-political uh, uh, activities, a great interest uh, in, in politics, but almost no any real uh, 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 activity. Uh, since then, I can say that I'm very much uh, uh, active in almost any a program that uh, is dealing with with shared society and partnership. I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm probably one of the heads, leaders of a peace initiative called Two States, One Homeland. Uh, by the way, I've I've come to real come to know this peace initiative uh, directly f uh, after uh, 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 doing this course. Uh, I got uh, uh, f uh, acquainted with several particip participants from the peace movement, and since then I've uh, represented them in several international forums like the EU and uh, uh, etc. Uh, I'm very much uh, uh, engaged in the, uh, uh, local activities, uh, like in my hometown, Akka, which is uh, located in northern Israel. Uh, I'm, uh, me and Nasreen actually are part of uh, an initiative called the Alliance, which uh, try to 
uh, uh, try in in action and in ideation to build a camp. Build a camp. So uh, an another uh, friend of us, Samir, which never mentioned earlier, is another uh, participant, uh, another member of this wonderful group that. Uh, have already internalized that it should harness this historical mo uh, moment that we spoke about to to make this uh, island a continent, make this island spread, export its understanding of a shared society, of an equal uh, shared society to the whole of uh, uh, the uh, of all of Israel. Uh, since then, I. Uh, write almost uh, on a weekly basis on uh, on media trying to export this uh, thoughts to to uh, as uh, much as we can to people outside this uh, uh, circles uh, and I'm also here in Neve at Neve Shalom doing what I what what I do so this all uh, 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 this meaningful journey to me started four years ago. This started because I was lucky enough to be here four years ago and start this uh, 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 journey that I see. I see it that no less than a life journey that will continue uh, uh, until we achieve our goals and uh, and even after that. So. Thank you, thank you, Nava, for introducing me to this uh, 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 meaningful journey, and thank you for listening. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Ruth Ebenstein. I'm going to give you an example. I think I'm going to talk a little bit about the experiential aspect of the of the course, and not just the results, because I'm I imagine you're curious what happens in the room. What's it like? When you talk about recruitment, my husband is a professor in the psych department at Tel Aviv University. He was sitting with his best friend having lunch. Nava sat down, and his best friend is, I think, an academic advisor, or an, uh, someone who, who is following the program. And then Nava described the program. And he said, oh my god, my wife has to do that. And that's how I got here. So it really can be kind of chance meetings. I was in the, um, I was in the um, mental health professionals course. It's mental health professionals and other, and uh, community organizers and other, and I kind of went under other. I'm a journalist, and I do do some community organizing. I was a peace activist and have a very, very close Palestinian friend who lives in the West Bank who's like family. So in that respect, I was close to it, but I want to tell you what it's like when you start the course. You come here. You sit down, it's funny, Roe just slipped out and went upstairs. But this place puts Arabic first. Nobody does that. And if they've done that, it's because someone who's done the course has said that to them. Right, and so, but it's everything, it's the literature. Now that makes perfect sense. If you have Palestinians from 48 and Palestinians from 67 and Jewish Israelis, we're the minority group here. Why should our language be first? And they start speaking, and, and there's like a lot of Arabic. And Roe looks to me like Jewish Israeli, and he's speaking Arabic, and everyone's speaking Arabic. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, like I'm, I, I don't even remember the Arabic I studied 24 years ago or whatever, you know, the tiny bit that I knew. But the sense, and they just throw you in the water. They put you into groups, and people start saying to me, so you're friends with Ibtissam because you want to write a book about her? Now, I met Ibtissam through a breast cancer support group, and she's like my sister, really. She's one of my closest friends, but I was shocked. And someone said, any time a Jewish Israeli wants to be friends with me, I'm like, what's the agenda? So these things make you, I'm thinking like, in my community or where I come from, nobody suspects me of any of that. I was shocked. You know, I went and ran home and told all my Palestinians, like my friends who are, I, you know, from Beit Jal, I was like, can you believe they said that about me? But the point is, that candor, that sincerity, that saying, like, this is what it's like to be me. This is what it's like to be me living in this country. Do you want to be friends with me? Like, what's your agenda? 
And that was so profound that the course takes you to Aqaba. You know, Israel likes to pretend it's in Europe. Well, hey, Bibi, we're not in Europe. We're in the Middle East. And again, when you go to Aqaba, when you go to Jordan, again, you realize, like, you are the minority. Your culture, whatever, like, that, that's what this neighborhood is. And I remember I slipped out, and I went to the bathroom, and there was a Palestinian wedding going on that was beautiful. The familiarity that we're talking about is the food. It's the culture. It's the music. It's people getting up and singing, and you getting accustomed and acclimated to you know, Palestinian music, Palestinian food, Palestinian language, humor, many different things, cultural things that you don't know about. And they're saying the things that they wouldn't say to you, but they will in this environment. And the reason I'm saying that is uh, Nava really is a rock star. I'm a journalist, and I've written articles about Nava, and she's usually too busy doing the work to actually do the interview. You know, and I say this lovingly, like, she's doing the work. So how much time do we have for the interview? Like, how long is this going to take, Ruth? And, and in that sense, I'm trying to disseminate the ideas of Neve Shalom Wa Salam out. And, and whether it's to Jewish publications or a general audience, etc. Like, how do we get this message out? And it's funny because that, that requires some fine-tuning. I'm telling you about that discomfort and... There's a lot of pain. I would recommend reading Nava's book. I don't, I'm, she's not giving me a percentage. It's not boring. It's fascinating. I know some of the people in that book. It's still fascinating. Um, there's a lot of pain in doing this course. A lot of pain. I sort of said, wait a minute, I'm American. I haven't been in the army. Like I was a Jewish American, so I was a minority in the United States. I grew up in Michigan. Michigan is the largest Arab American community. And, you know, that was very familiar. My mother's a Holocaust survivor. So it's not that my mother came here and kicked out, you know, like, and I, she didn't come here kicking out someone else. Like I sort of had, you know, like I had to kind of wrap myself around so many of these different elements of my narrative and what's, and, and, and what, what Palestinians have lost. You know, I haven't met many Jewish families who've named their daughter Warsaw. But there are Palestinians who name their children after the villages that they've lost, being kicked out of your home. And no one's saying you're sorry. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a part in Sari Nuseba's book where he talks about how he lived abroad for many years. You know, he married the daughter of an Oxford Don, and he comes back. And he almost hit someone with his car, and he said he was sorry, and he went home, and his father was out of town, and his father came back. And he said, sorry, what's wrong with you? Like, we have to go do a sukha. And like 70 people from the family went to this woman's village to say they're sorry, to apologize, to take responsibility. So think of how, how deep that is not, why can't you say Nakba? Why can't you say that? So the pain of the Nakba, um, the language, the culture, what people aren't saying to you, all of that, you know, I live across the street from Abu Tor. When you walk by, it says, it talks a little bit about what happened, you know, how was Abu Tor conquered in Jerusalem? And you say to yourself, like, do you read that sign? Does your heart bleed for your side, the Palestinian side, for all people? Like, that's when you start to understand that, that's what this course gives you. You hurt, but then you say, you hurt full stop. And you realize that you, you almost can't right the wrong, but you can take responsibility for the wrong. You can be part of the solution. So I'm, sort of, I'm saying to you all, like what you're doing supporting this place is so profound because they can't really say, I gave Ruth consciousness. I gave Ruth consciousness that she's going to take to every single article. I have taken the tools I've learned, and you know, it, they taught me that I'm responsible for my group. So what's my group? So it's, Ruth, even if you didn't serve in the military, if you live in this country and you pay taxes, and that's going to go towards the occupation, towards West Bank, then it's on you. 
And that is a really profound and important lesson. And the idea of expanding your identity to make room for the other, and also asking Palestinians to do that for you. You know, I would, and, and not, that's important too. So understanding that, you know, Palestinians, there is, can be a Palestinian position saying, we don't have an army, you do. And so we think all bets are off. Like we can do whatever we can to try to foment change for our vision. And, and, and will you open yourself up and listen to that, no matter what you think about that? So um, I want to show you something. It, it's really in so many different aspects of my life. I started a book club, a Palestinian writer's book club. And for, for you know, English-speaking women, we're reading The Secret Life of Saeed, the Pest Optimist by Amir Habibi. And we've read other books. And these are women who are pretty active also. And I said to myself, I bet you there are things that we can glean in literature that we can't learn in other ways. And I'll give you an example. My friend's a journalist, and she said, we read In Search of Fatima by Dr. Lada Karmi. And she talks about leaving. She talks about driving away from her house, and her nanny is there, and her dog. And then later, she tells you what it's like. They moved to England. Her parents' marriage kind of falls apart. They were held together by Palestinian society. But once they go to England, they're lost. But she thinks she's coming home in three months. And my friend said to me, now I get it. How many times as a journalist has someone shown me a key to a house? I didn't get it. But reading this book, I get it. And this course taught me to, to try to seek out those things too. What is being said in literature? Like, what are the different things that I'm not learning that I don't know? So anyway, I don't know if I've talked over my time. I didn't look at my watch. But um, anyway, I really, I feel tremendous gratitude. I feel gratitude for the pain. I don't want to be oblivious. And I don't want to not know. You know, once your eyes are opened, they're not going to close again. And I'm a relentlessly optimistic person. I grew up in the Midwest of America. It's like a very happy, clappy place. So I do believe there can be change. And I... And I write articles. I mean, there are many different things going on beyond innovation. There are some little pockets where you make, their differences are being made. So, yes. Anyway, sorry. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ziv. And I'm also a graduate of the uh, upcoming politicians uh, in the School for Peace seminar. And, um, yeah, I really feel for the things that you've said because... Um, when I was uh, uh, exposed to this, uh, to this seminar, uh, I, I wasn't really aware about what's going to happen. And then uh, we came to the first day, and I remember Nava says on the opening day that uh, one of the goals of this seminar is to uh, put everything on the table uh, regarding the discussion about the Israel-Palestine conflict and the occupation and everything related to it. And... Um, also, to break uh, what's called the normalization uh, regarding the occupation. And I felt, I thought, uh, well, I had some interactions with Palestinians, Arab Palestinians, uh, if it was in the military, uh, the Israeli military that I've served, or in the university. Um, but that was the opportunity to actually engage and build um, really deep relationships with Palestinians. And uh, yeah, we come to the, to the Aqaba seminar. And uh, we have uh, five days for intensive discussions about uh, the conflict. And um, the group instructors tells us, OK, the floor is open. Anybody wants to raise any issue and start a conversation? And then I see an unusual phenomenon. Uh, while the Jewish group, in general speaking, says, um, we want to talk about how we are going uh, for a solution towards the ending of the occupation and uh, changing this uh, wrong state of affairs. Um, the Arab group tells us, well, wait, why are, why are you uh, rushing forward? Let's talk about the past. We have a lot to discuss. 
let's talk about the Nakba, let's talk about the 67 war, let's talk about the occupation, about everything wrong is going on, about the war crimes. And at the beginning, we don't know really how to handle it because we tell ourselves, well, we are the people who want to cut, who came here to talk with you. And you are blaming us for a lot of things. And it's a lot to handle. Um, so, yeah, it took us, I guess, the first two days, or maybe also for the third day, to understand that in order to proceed and move to a full discussion, we need to figure out some stuff about the past, have some recognition, um, work on our, uh, let's say, our vocabulary and the matter of speech when we are talking about uh, a lot of issues regarding the Israel-Palestine conflict. And it taught me a lot about it. And uh, in the process of this seminar and towards the entire uh, year and a half that we had uh, the meetings, um, I got to, to meet Rajai Hamid. Um, he's a good friend nowadays. He lives in Bet Anan village. Um, and he started to tell me about his life story, about how he uh, used to be in the popular front organization and uh, um, participated in some acts against Israel and against the occupation, and he was in the Israeli prison. And uh, afterwards, he started to walk, uh, to sneak in to Jerusalem, to, to work, to make a living to him and to his family, and how he changed his attitude. Uh, towards uh, going to cooperation uh, with Jewish people and, uh, and understand that there must be a, a different solution from what he used to think. Um, so yeah, what, what I think about the seminar, uh, and one of the things that the seminar uh, gave me the most is the, that I realized that even though we got into a lot of dead ends towards the, the, uh, the discussions, and we had a lot of, of them, um, I think that we kind of, gained a mutual respect to each other about the fact that uh, we know that we have different opinions, we know that we have a lot to talk about and work a lot of things out, but even though we had those dead ends, we always knew to relax and come back and try again. And in the, in the, even though like, we have the differences towards the discussions, even though they became very loud, we knew afterwards how to relax and speak in the dinners and make friends to with each other, nevertheless. And it's still, it's still floating. The, the disagreements uh, floating a lot, even though when I talk to Ajay on the phone and we have some of the mi minor disagreements about the things that we are doing now in our uh, uh, nowadays uh, project, I'm going to talk about it soon. And nevertheless, we, we are studying each other we are trying to think, um, well, we're trying to be optimistic and to understand that uh, the process might take uh, long, but it's better for us, much better for us, to do it together. Um, and uh, while I was in the seminar, in the School for Peace seminar, I started uh, practicing natural beekeeping. And I went away abroad to study it, and I was really fascinated by the, the life of the bees. And um, after the seminar, I told Rajai, let's have, uh, let's have a mutual project together regarding the bees. Let's uh, build bridges between Jewish and Arabs uh, by practicing natural beekeeping. And especially uh, regarding to the Palestine uh, area, well, <clears throat> one of the, well, one example of the normalization that we speak of is that many Palestinians come to Israel, whether if it's legal or illegal, to work inside the, the Israeli territory and to make uh, uh, income for, to, to support their families. And during the project that we have, uh, during the setup, um, a friend of mine uh, introduced me to a beekeeper from Shweke village near Tulkarem. Uh, his name is Rafat Maadawi. And I went to, to see him uh, he went inside Israel, he can go inside Israel, and we went to observe some fields, uh, optional fields, to see if we can put some hives over there. And then he tells me, yeah, you see the fence over there? Uh, that's the part of the wall where the Palestinians uh, come inside. And I tell them, well, I, I know a little bit this area. What about uh, the security? The, the, the soldiers don't come and uh, push them away. And he tells me, no. 
they really come freely. There is like uh, one guy who sneaks them in. He's kind of the, the bookie of all this process. He takes the money in order to let them uh, uh, sneak in without uh, getting caught. And then they come to Israel, sometimes even spend uh, a month inside Israel, and they work in construction, in agriculture, and then they go back. And uh, that leaves the uh, Palestinian employees without workers, with a lot of unemployment. And it only, well, on the one hand, you can say, well, it's good because the Palestinians get work and they, they are getting paid more in the Israeli side. But on the other hand, it's a totally uh, a state of affairs of normalization that the Palestinians are dependent on Israel to come inside. And when the Israeli authorities will want to seize this uh, phenomenon from happening, so it's a matter of a day that it happens. Um, so, because of different logistic and uh, funding issues, we decided first to do the pilot of the project in here, in the Wacht el Salam, Neve Shalom, and uh, we set up an apiary uh, in the area of the village, and uh, we work uh, together with the elementary school uh, that you've been in, in here this morning. And uh, once a week I come to the class and I give some uh, lectures to the kids about uh, the bees and their uh, unique social life. And uh, during the, the early spring we're going to start intensive work, field work in the apiary in order to sustain our hives and enlarge them. And what I would like to, uh, that the kids will take, uh, I would like to inspire them from the uh, life of the bees about the really special uh, social life that uh, embodies the equity that happens in the beehive. And I would love if they will uh, have a reflection from their life into their own community, in their school, you know, in their family, um, in their, uh, in their uh, area, in the village and in Israel and Palestine as a whole. And uh, to have this educational uh, job from bottom to top. Thank you. Okay, so now good evening after the good morning and good afternoon. Um, my name is Shirin Najjar. I think we, you know me already. So what do I have to look in for in the School for Peace? I was 20 years old. Why did I join the School for Peace? After getting all along my life, the village here, having the educational system, everything, I went, okay, I thought, what do I want to study? Yeah, all of my life is always spontaneously. I will go to the agriculture faculty. I'll go because I like it. Nice to study biochemistry and food science. So I signed there. It's in Rehovot nearby. And then I find myself for the first time, oh my God, I'm the only Arab girl in a huge university classroom. Okay, so where do I start from here? It's nice. It was 1999, the only one, Paul, the youngest, the girl. Look, no, it's no hijab yet, so they don't they know the difference. If I'm Arab, Jewish, I can play in all of the backgrounds. But also, spontaneously or not, the second intifada started just a month after. Oh, my God, here the second intifada started, and I started being the feeling this uh, tension of being the only Arab students, I didn't say Palestinian, yes, Palestinian in this huge university classroom. Everyone were starting to speak, the Israelis, what is going on about this Palestinian that are, uh, that are making a revolution, that they like, um, they don't appreciate what we give them in this country. We have uh, Shahids, people, Palestinian inside Israel are being shot from the Israeli policies and attacking again Gaza, West Bank, everyone, everything is, for me, it's a whole huge different reality. And looking at Israeli students coming with their uniform as soldiers, what? And speaking to themselves how what they did, where they come from, how they, they humiliate Arabs now, or Palestinians, or being proud, yes or not. But I, for the first time, I felt I'm being muted. Like I'm no one there, and I don't want to be there. What do I do with my life? OK, should I quit life, reality, or can I continue? So I heard 
uh, okay, there is a course that is starting in the School for Peace to being a facilitator as other, as I said, other uh, decisions. I say, yalla, let's go. They have a one spot. I will continue here to be a facilitator in the School for Peace. And this also made a big change in my life. How did it change after being raised here? Now I feel a relief. <laughs> I'm not the only girl, uh, Arab girl in this classroom. We are divided half by half. So it's a huge relief. I have a power here, as you said, my language. I can speak Arabic and you will not understand. Huh, I can laugh, whatever you want. So now you can feel out. I will not feel out because I can, we can have a whole conversation in Arabic and you will not understand. I have a control. It's the first time in the room I have a control. I can control in the language and I can control of you. Okay, suffer. Okay, Jewish suffer. You have everyone is suffering. So I don't want to admit with your suffer. It's the first time I can be in charge of to admit it or not. Yes, you can have your memorial day without the pressure that I should admit, yes, that you had a sorrow. So I have here a two points to be empowered with. And because, how does it happen? In the, in the room, it's the first place where you have combined two facilitators, Arab and Jew, a Palestinian and Israeli. So the power is in a way in between. So you are not more, you don't have power more than me as Israelis. Not like in university that all of the team, everything is Israeli, the flags, the history, uh, it was also the Memorial Day of Rabin. Everything was so Israeli, no mentioning of course anything about Palestinians. So here I felt very much empowered and I want to be here. Whatever bothers me there in the university or in reality or in Tel Aviv or in everywhere, I can say it here very easily. Out, I am muted. I can't tell any colleagues or anyone at work what I really feel. I can't tell him what I feel when I see you in Israeli uniforms. I heard you speaking about what you were doing in your duty in the West Bank or in Jerusalem or everywhere or to my own people. But here I have the power to say, and I have a Palestinian and Israeli facilitator, they will protect me, that I can say whatever I want. Because if I would say it in university or in other reality, I will get, of course, a warning that I can be um, a promoting for terror or, 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 or other things, or I'm, or I'm acting against Israeli policy, Israeli state, other things, that I'm a racist. So I like this life. I like this room very much. And I wanted to invest more in this. So I finished my degree, khalas, okay, biochemistry and food science. And I continued with all of this intercultural, interreligious, um, political, all of these mixed things. And uh, I also took the, a course with my father. It was to be a mediator. It's very different. Can I be a mediator? I want more energy in the room, but mediator, it's a different term. But it's nice time, time to be there also. And eight years ago, as I told you, and before, I moved to, I started working in East Jerusalem. Now I know that the reality of East Jerusalem, what a reality. It's very, it's occupation. They are Jerusalem, resident, Israel resident, they have an Israeli uh, identity card, but they don't have citizenship, that means they don't have a passport. They pay all of the taxes, they make all of their duties, they don't get services. So walk in the streets, we were making very a lot of jokes with the car, with everything, like you will pay every, to fix your car, and you are in East Jerusalem. No garbage, garbage is all around. So you don't get not services, not cleaning, not um, uh, electricity, water supply, it is very bad. I'm still a worker with no hijab in East Jerusalem. So I still have my power inside. I can tell soldier whatever I want because they don't distinguish or they don't know I'm Arab or Palestinian. So I, as again, I can play in all uh, grounds. And as uh, before said, she said, if I, uh, pay, uh, if I pass a checkpoint, I can get it and play it very easily. With my one smile, you will pass very smooth with the soldier. They can be very nice and they can give you a lot of uh, they can give you a lot of uh, sexual, sexual yes. <laughs> you are very nice. You look nice. No, 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 no. Well, it's nice because you want to pass. So just one smile from a girl in a checkpoint and you pass very easy. 
until uh, as I told you before, I can wear, I can work, <laughs> I can re uh, um, write a book, The Life Before Hijab and After. Seven years ago, I decided I want to wear the hijab, to have a different lifestyle. Again, again, I felt very muted in the reality of East Jerusalem. To pass a checkpoint, pass or not. It's not really a question if you can pass very easily. And all who were very nice before, they are not nice. I felt like I'm nothing there. When you, your life worth nothing in this reality. So how does it connect it with the room, the school for peace room? Here I have a chair. Me and the Israelis, we worth the same thing in this room. So for me, again, it was a stage where I feel that my power is back to me. So I can say things, I can distinguish things. Uh, yes, as an Israeli participant, you will have a facilitator with a hijab. It's not an easy, he will not have her somewhere else. Palestinian, Muslim, woman with a hijab, it's a lot of stages to, 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 to adjust for participants. Also for Arabs, it's not always easy to, to adjust all of these uh, things. But this is, what I, this is what is for me the empowerment. And this is what for me, I find it the most uh, easy or not easy, but the, the, the most loving work for me because it's a stage for all. And I think I, for my, my rule is to empower my, gru my group as much as I was empowered in this room. The one that most influenced me in my life, in this professional, being a facilitator, beside my father was Ahmed Hijazi. He was a manager of the School for Peace. So he had a lot of things to say. He was very easy man, like it was funny how easy he was. In that time, I remember 10 years ago, I told him, Ahmad, I have a cousin with a hijab, and they don't let her come with me to the sport uh, class. They told her she should put it out. He tells me, OK, so tell them they should put their pants out. And me, of course, I'm without a hijab. I can say it, so you can put your pants out. Then what do you mean? I told, her, I told her to put something out. I will tell you to put something out the same. You choose what? I choose what? So I could say it before the hijab. Again, with this reality, with the hijab, I'm muted again in, in a lot of places. But in the village, in, in general, in the school for peace in particular, I feel the power is mine like an equal. And no one can here again control my life as I've been controlled everywhere else. I know I'm saying a lot of things, but I think this Methods are thanks to the School for Peace for the whole years. Nava, Ahmad, my father, Abdul Salam Najar, and everyone that's passed all of this way. I had also uh, Wafa and Michal as a facilitators. Also women, a lot of women. <laughs> we are, I think, I don't know if women <laughs> in this field. We work a lot because maybe it's our stage to say things that we are silent somewhere else. Maybe it's our stage, maybe. I, I, I tell you, I can write a lot of books, but, uh, but I prefer <laughs> I start <laughs> before and after. And as again, I say, like, it's not that I don't get benefits from how I look. In my own society, it's much easier to be covered. In my own, where I walk, walk around, in my own Palestinian or Arabic uh, local place, just local, if it's my, in my husband's uh, family, in my parents' families, it's much easier. Like you get a, an easy passport that you're in a good position, that you do your duties well, because I come from conservative religious families. But when I want to pass to the, these checkpoints, it's, they are not even points. It's a huge, we say Kalandia checkpoint. It's not a checkpoint. It's a fence, with, humiliating fence with a lot of, place to pass or not. So I'm muted there and I have a loud, I think, voice here and uh, a lot of thinking of these methods that the School for Peace have and the village is, uh, is hugging us with. Hi, I'm sorry because I don't speak English. I speak in Hebrew and Nava Samah. 
אוקיי, אני אדבר על התקופה הכי רחוקה עכשיו. על תשעים הייתי תלמידה בתיכון, ועצם העובדה שאני עדיין זוכרת את התקופה הזו, אז זאת אומרת שזה ממש השפיע על החיים שלי ועל כל ההתפתחות אחרי זה. סיימתי ללמוד תואר שני במגדר, ועכשיו אני לומדת הנחיה ב... דיאלוג מוזיקלי, והכוונות שלי ללמוד גם הנחיה בבית ספר לשלום אחרי זה. את הקבוצה הזו ש, ש, של אז, של 93, אני עדיין זוכרת עד היום, ואני זוכרת שזו פעם ראשונה שהייתה לי הזדמנות לשבת מול, מול האחר, ב, אולי ב, בגובה העיניים או אחד לאחד, לא לא כמו כל מפגש אחר שהיה לי, בגלל שכאילו אנחנו חיים בין אה, הרבה כפרים או הרבה מושבים של, של יהודים, אה, והיינו, כאילו הייתי קרובה לנו, לגבעת חביבה, אה, הלכנו הרבה למפגשים בגבעה שם, וממש זה היה שונה. שם היו, כאילו, מבחינת גיל, היו, אני זוכרת שהיו יותר גדולים מאיתנו, ו... ולמשל שם אני זוכרת שדווקא עשה לי לא טוב. להבדיל מכאן, כאילו שהיו, ב... קודם כל היו בגיל שלנו ואנחנו, הוויכוחים היו כאילו ממש באותה רמה ו... וכאילו בארבעיניים ב... ב... גם, הם היו, אנחנו היינו תיכונים והם היו כאילו אחרי צבא אפילו חלק מהם ואני לא אשכח משפט אחד שאחד מהם אז שמה אמר לי שלמה הוא צריך את הערבית ולמה הוא בא לכאן ללמוד ערבית הוא בא ללמוד ערבית כי עוד מעט יהיה שלום ואז נהיה צריך, הוא, הוא כאילו יהיה צריך את הכסף של הערבים ואנחנו צריכים את השכל שלו אז את המשפט הזה עשה לי לא טוב וזו הייתה הפעם האחרונה שהייתי שם, דיברתי על החוויה ההיא כאילו, כי הלא, טוב, הלא טובה, כי, כי עכשיו אני אדבר על החוויה הטובה, אני, אני זוכרת ש, שאולי המפגש היה ממש בתקופת אוסלו, ו, ואז אנחנו והחבר'ה היהודים הגענו למין הסכם כזה ש... ש המחנך שלנו אפילו היה גאה בנו, כאילו שלא ויתרנו ודיברנו איתם ככה בארבע עיניים ולא ויתרנו להם על שום דבר. אני זוכרת גם כאילו כשישבנו אנחנו החבר'ה, הקבוצה הערבית ביחד, אני זוכרת התמיכה גם שקיבלנו אז מאחמד חג'אזי והרגשתי כאילו ש, שעכשיו גם אתם עניין, גם אתם חשובים, גם אתם היינו ביחד, ישבנו ביחד, נתן לנו הנחיה מאוד, כאילו, מאוד עשירה, ש... שנתנה לנו את הבוש הזה לשבת ולהתווכח ולהגיד מה שבא לנו ומה אנחנו חושבים, וכאילו, זו פעם ראשונה שהיינו במפגש שלא לא היה מפחיד. אני חושבת שהחוויה הזו השפיעה עליי עד כדי כך שלפני עשר שנים כשחשבתי לגדל ילדים, עלה לי עוד הפעם המקום הזה בראש וחשבתי שזה המקום הנכון לגדל ילדים כי, כי חוויה קטנה כזו היא עדיין אצלי בראש החוויה הזו אני חייבת להעביר אותה לחיים שלמים של הבנים שלי היום אנחנו חיים כאן, אני ממש מרוצה, הילדים שלי הולכים לבית הספר והם כל, כל בוקר קמים והולכים בשמחה ואני חושבת שבחרתי במקום הנכון לגדל ילדים Thank you Several times, the uh, name of uh, Ahmad Hijazi, Zechrono Livracha, uh, came up, and you can see how many people were touched by his work. I brought some books that we, of his writings. Uh, uh, some people took, but tomorrow I will bring you more. I wish everybody will have and will... It's in uh, Arabic, Hebrew, and English, uh, so you can read some of his writing, and was really a unique person that we lost in the 2012, very early in his life. Uh, but uh, let's... 
ask some questions, our, our panelists. First of all, I want to thank each and every one of you. It's very moving. And I am always so conflicted when I begin to speak about how this place changed my life eight years ago. And I am confounded as to why the Hasbara, the, er, there is no press, there is no information that comes to especially the American Jewish communities. Uh, and I would love to have information, your writings, your stories, every story here was an inspiration to me. And I want to convene 100 people in my community to hear all of you. But I want the, especially the, the Jewish press in the United States. I know it's very conflicting. There are a lot of conflicts. But it needs, your stories need to be told. And I, for one, am very happy to tell them. But a video like this, how can it happen? So each one of you has spoken about a feeling of responsibility for doing. Um, and, and the weight of that responsibility leads you to take action. I'm, I'm wondering if you would speak about, at least some of you would speak about, um, that impact on your own lives, on your own professional lives, the, this sense that, that there is an urgency to doing the work now that you've really found the way to be, the way to live. Uh, well, thank you also from my side uh, for all these open-hearted uh, uh, testimonies of uh, your um, experiences as a school for peace. Um, well, you went through quite a process. First, the recruitment and maybe the many inconvenient moments uh, during the confrontations, uh, during the courses, and now that you're back in society and in your work. Uh, every one of you has uh, special programs, uh, but, well, you're out there uh, and uh, trying to do your work. What could help you in the process, uh, in, in the network, uh, which could uh, support you? Uh, once in your, the third stage now, you're back uh, as a, an ambassador or a worker for peace. Uh, what could help you um, to uh, maintain your work and keep up the process? Because you're not finished, you're just starting at the end of the school. So what of kind of support do you need, or what could the School for Peace do for you to even support you more in your work? I'm a peace journalist, which means, I mean, that's not how I pay the bills, but that's what I have passion about. And that means I seriously approach every single article thinking, what can I do with this story to tell the story of peace? Now, what's funny is when I did... I interviewed Nava when Israel was like to mark 70 years of Israel. I thought that, you know, the Israeli, Jewish Israeli most inspires me is Nava. And I want to interview her. And it was, um, and, and I've, we've actually done two stories. And one ran in Lilith magazine and one ran in Fathom. And so I have, uh, I actually have business cards and these bookmarks that when we do public speaking with Ibtissam. I will happily pass these out. But I have... I actually write the articles and, and look for Jewish newspapers to publish them in, or general press. Um, I'm actually doing something now that if I have the right data, the New York Times is interested in on a, on, on a program that brings together Jewish and, and uh, Palestinian kids. So I agree with you. In fact, I have an idea when you talk about what can you do to help. I have an idea of creating a website that is positive stories from this region in Hebrew, English, and Arabic, or I should say Hebrew, Arabic, and English, or English, you know, however we want to do it, um, telling positive stories. There are many websites now, and, you know, The Guardian has something called The Upside. Uh, the Washington Post has something called The Optimist. There are several different things like that that tell good news, where people go for just good news. And I feel that there should be a focus on the good things that are happening here that you go to, and not that it's not important to do everything, but sometimes people don't have the energy for that, and they'd love to just hear the positive things. So that's a project that I'm thinking about, how to establish that, looking for a Palestinian partner to do that. I just got like a tiny bit of seed funding to get started. Um, but how has it affected my professional life is every single, like anything that I hear about, I think, how can I share? So 
Last year I heard about this thing called Dance for Kindness, which is a flash mob. And so I called my friends in Gaza and said, do you guys want to do this? And so then they did that and, we, and it was like on Israeli news and, and, I, and you know, that's a big part of the Palestinian story that people don't know about or don't even see Gazans, etc. So for me, it's just, as a journalist, it's something that I'm constantly thinking about. That, you know, what, where could I get this out? And in the Jewish press, but beyond. Okay, about um, where can you hear us? So how can you hear us? So uh, in our project, you can follow our Facebook page if you'd like. It's called Let Me Be. And I keep it updated with the activities that, uh, <laughs> that are being held uh, during the, the Honeypath project. And it's in, in let me be, and be with double E, of course, yeah. And um, it's all written in English, I'm trying my best, um, so uh, stay tuned over there. Um, about uh, some difficulties in this professional life of, uh, well, let's say, uh, natural beekeeping and the, the School for Peace, uh, the Honeypath project, it's always, when people ask me what exactly I do, well, sometimes I have to think twice if I want to get into it right now, you know, because it will bring up a lot of issues. And, well, yeah, yeah it takes a lot of uh, emotions and time trying to explain because, uh, well, they say you have to, to be able to explain yourself in a, in a one-liner. But after you say this one-liner, so questions pop up and uh, let's, like, it's not our responsibility, uh, why should we do it, uh, and a lot of arguments that are uh, starting. So, uh, sometimes I do get into it, and I'm trying my best to advocate for uh, our cause. And um, some people, well, starting to accept it, and it's really nice, and sometimes I bring my friends over uh, to the apiary, and tell them more thoroughly what I do, and I show them some videos, and uh, I tell them about my experiences with the students, and I always tell them uh, like how it's funny that uh, I'm studying Arabic for my third year, and I'm trying to, to speak uh, with the students in the class. And I told them on the first class, uh, my level is like a um, first grader. So every time I try to, to speak Arabic with them, so they laugh at me, and they correct me a little bit, so it's really nice uh, to, like, to break the ice and to, to get them more engaged, uh, well, there is, even though it's a bilingual school, the Arab children have a kind of a language barrier in Hebrew for some words that they say that I think that are obvious. Well, for kids in general, it's not always easy, so it's nice to, to try and uh, speak Arabic uh, during the classes. And um, there was another question about uh, how, 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 how you can help. So uh, first, uh, I would like to thank the, the School for Peace and the Wacht al Salam uh, NGO for helping us so far uh, with, the, with the funding and with a lot of uh, different type of connections and uh, a lot of facili uh, well, facilities that will that help us to, um, to establish the apiary. The apiary is in the uh, Wacht al Salam uh, area, the village area. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of weird and unusual requests sometimes, but uh, we are getting there, and I think that most of the help right now is just uh, uh, follow us, uh, tell people about it, um, tell them what we are doing, and we're going to have a really special and really fun things that we are going to do with, with the kids, so just uh, be with us online and uh, tell people about it. We want to have as much exposure as we can. Yes, we would love to get your support to expand the project, as I said, to the uh, border-based project in the Palestine territory to be able to bring Palestinians and Jewish people and also have the beekeeping courses over there and give some employment opportunities to the Palestinians that they will have a, a beekeeping a training and then they'll have the honey that they can sell uh, in the Palestine uh, area and also to have a, a model of the discussions that we had in our seminar uh, during this uh, beekeeping course. We want to integrate between those two. So we would love to have your support. I want to add something small. Every time I go to Tichon in Kfar Kara and ask if the project is still there, and I realized that it's not, and I also asked here in Nave Shalom, and I realized that it's not, אז אני ממש מתאכזבת, 
כי כל הזמן היה, היה הפרויקט הזה, לדעתי, כל כך פרויקט חשוב. אני חושבת שהמפגש הזה זה המפגש הראשון של בני תיכון, הם ילדים כאילו בגיל שלהם, שהם יושבים ומדברים ב, ב, באותה רמה, באותה, ב, באותו גובה עיניים, ולפני האוניברסיטה, אז לדעתי זה מאוד מאוד חשוב וצריכים אותו, ואני כאילו מקווה שימשיך. Thank you all. Thank you, Nava, Harb, and Ruth. Uh, you and me have to, to speak because uh, we have so much in common about media and women and journalism and um, positive uh, uh, stories.